to have as much uh, information about. And here the two of them are at the third plenum, uh, December 1978, the one that launched reform and opening, uh, the two of them sharing the platform uh, as they begin that process. Two months before uh, Dung went uh, to uh, the third plenum, he went to Japan. He had worked over the summer to uh, try to improve relations with Japan. In 1972, they had officially normalized relations between China and Japan. But they had not really advanced. There were so many issues that had not been settled. And Dung decided he would go for a week uh, in Japan and meet Chinese leaders, uh, and meet the Japanese leaders, and try to build a basis for cooperation so that Japan could play a role in helping modernize uh, China. Uh, the, roughly, China and Japan, depending on which history you read, they had about 2,500 years of some contact between people before this time. But the first time a Chinese leader ever met the Emperor of Japan was in October 1978 when Deng uh, met Emperor Hirohito. And here he is, Deng, with his wife drawn in, and the Emperor is the Emperor. The Emperor apologized for the horrible things they had done in World War II, said we must work to make sure this never happens again, and Deng reported that he was very happy with that luncheon to our meeting, uh, and Deng could then take this picture uh, and take the mood that grew around this meeting back to the Chinese people. Uh, Deng wanted not only to get the Japanese to be willing to help the, the Chinese, he wanted the Chinese people, many of whom still hated Japan for World War II, uh, to be willing to go to the Japanese, to learn from them, uh, to bring in ideas, uh, to be their understudies in the process of helping modernize. <clears throat> Here Dummy is uh, in Japan uh, visiting uh, Kimitsu, uh, perhaps the most modern steel plant at the time, the one that became the model for the first modern Chinese steel plant in Baoshan being escorted by Yinyam Yoshiro, who is the uh, head of uh, New Japan Steel. Uh, as you know now, China probably has more miles of high-speed rail train than any other country. But in October 1978, China had zero miles. The first time a Chinese leader rode on a high-speed train was October 1978, when Deng was in uh, Japan. Uh, a lot of Chinese I interviewed said that Dung was not always overly talkative, uh, as they put it to me, uh, he didn't speak too much. Uh, and so when they asked him uh, what did he think of this ride uh, on the Shinkansen, uh, he said, it's very fast. <laughs> Here he is meeting uh, former Prime Minister Tanaka Kakuei, then under house arrest, uh, who had uh, been the Prime Minister when relations were normalized. Uh, here he is uh, the next month uh, in Singapore. Uh, he had visited uh, Thailand, Malaysia, and now Singapore. Uh, you people here are probably all familiar with, with this great visit, uh, which uh, Dean uh, James Tong mentioned. Uh, and uh, when I talked to, to uh, um, your minister mentor uh, about this visit, uh, he told the story, which probably most of you know, that uh, he knew that Dung had uh, certain habits. Dung said, I have three bad habits. I smoke, I spit, and I drink. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as you know, uh, the minister mentor uh, did not smoke and uh, did not spit. Uh, however, before the meeting, uh, the minister mentor built a special little duct so that the tobacco smoke could go out, and so he would allow Dung to smoke. He also put a brand new spittoon there. Uh, Dung, knowing uh, the minister mentor's habits, neither spit uh, nor smoked during the visit. So I think it's a sign that these two people, Dung, about 25 years older than Lee Wen Yu, uh, <clears throat> had an enormous respect uh, for each other. And uh, Lee Wen Yu, uh, felt, as he explained to me, that the reason he respected them so much is that he inherited a system that he knew was not working, and he was willing to try to find a new system that would work, and was willing, therefore, 
uh, to introduce a completely different system. When President Carter came to office in 1977, the United States was not yet ready to normalize relations. Although Nixon Kissinger had visited uh, China, Nixon many, uh, once and uh, Kissinger many times, they did not really normalize relations until uh, the end of December 1978. Uh, but when uh, Carter had uh, been in office a few months, he decided his conditions were right to begin to normalize. And he sent Zhezinski, uh, his uh, assistant at the White House in charge of foreign affairs, to Dung to uh, begin the talks on normalization. The person that uh, Carter sent to Beijing uh, to carry on the negotiations was uh, Ambassador uh, Leonard Woodcock. And the reason he chose Woodcock is that he had a reputation as being a great negotiator who had the confidence and respect both of management and labor, and who also had a lot of political support in Washington so that when uh, there was recognition of mainland China as the new uh, partner for the United States, that he could help with the political support in Washington. During the course of the several months after Jasinski's visit, negotiations were held largely between Woodcock and this man in the center, uh, Huang Hua, the foreign minister, uh, over uh, normalization. But the last stage negotiations were done by Woodcock and Deng Xiaoping directly. Here they are toasting the end of the talks uh, and announcing that they will have normalization. The United States, uh, however, was a little concerned about how to make the invitation. Uh, Wago Fung still was chairman and premier, and the United States, therefore, was a little cautious in extending the invitation. So Woodcock said to Deng Xiaoping, uh, we would like to invite a Chinese leader uh, to come to the United States uh, to celebrate the normalization. And Dunn said, I'm ready, how about next month? <laughs> Here he is next month, uh, President Carter and uh, Deng Xiaoping at the White House. Uh, in the middle, yeah, I'm happy to say, as uh, somebody who studied at Harvard from 1948 to 50, uh, Ji Chao Zhu, who knew a great deal about the United States and was the main interpreter uh, during this visit and played a very uh, key role. Uh, here, Dung and Carter at the White House. Uh, it was a dramatic visit. And at the Kennedy uh, Performance Center uh, during that visit, uh, and President Carter and Dung went up on the stage and they held plans, they held the hands uh, while the band began to play Getting to Know You. <laughs> <laughs> and then they had a bunch of American children sing some of Dung's favorite songs. And Dung uh, spontaneously went up on the stage and uh, kissed them, including uh, Carter's own daughter, who was in the choir. Uh, here they are signing the normalization agreements. Uh, after uh, Watergate, uh, Nixon was not invited back to the White House. Uh, but Dung said, you know, we have a saying in Chinese, uh, that if you drink the water, you should remember who built the well. And the man on the American side who built the well of uh, resuming Chinese-American relations uh, was Nixon. So I'd like, uh, he said to Carter, you to invite him uh, to the White House when I come. So Nixon, it was the first time after Watergate, he was allowed to come back to the White House. And here Dung is uh, talking to Nixon and Carter. Now here's a picture of our unruly Congress. Uh, and you see in the middle of Deng Xiaoping and uh, Ji Chao Zhu, the interpreter. And then the Ji Chao Zhu's left, you see that white-haired old man uh, sitting, uh, Tip O'Neill, who is the uh, uh, House Speaker at the time, a man who is known for saying that all politics is local. After Deng visited the White House, he went over to visit Congress, and Tip O'Neill regaled Deng with stories of how Congress was fighting the White House. And uh, Deng liked him, they hit it off, and the next year, uh, O'Neill was his guest in China. But after the end of the, toward the end of this meeting, <clears throat> O'Neill said, we believe that the United States will need a balance of power, and we need a check on the American executive, and therefore it's a good system to have a legislature and an executive that are different and can provide some check. 
Deng said, wouldn't work in China. He wanted one strong party, and he didn't want the right of leadership. Uh, on his uh, week visit in the United States, Deng went to Atlanta, which is Carter's hometown, visited a modern Ford factory. Uh, and then he went to Texas uh, for a rodeo. And when he was at this rodeo, this young cowgirl rode up and handed him a hat. Uh, and then he put on the hat. Uh, in the United States, this hat uh, was seen as very positive. Here was a charming uh, person. Maybe he was a communist, but he was a nice enough guy. Maybe we could work with him anyhow. Um, but Orville Schell, a, a journalist who was there, who was a China specialist, uh, said that this picture had even greater impact in China. It essentially said to the Chinese people when it was conveyed back in China, that all this stuff about American imperialism, don't have to worry about that anymore. There's a lot we can learn from America. Enjoy learning about American life. Uh, we can learn and start enjoying and seeing good things in the United States. And this picture became a symbol of that new year that then started. Uh, here we are, uh, Secretary Blumenthal, three months later in Beijing, opened the embassy. <clears throat> now, the person in the American government perhaps had closer talk uh, with uh, Dunn than any other person was George Bush Sr. It happened in 1975 when Dunn was already in charge of foreign policy in Beijing that the U.S. was liaison office was there before an American embassy was there. Uh, the person who headed that was George Bush Sr. So during that year of 1975, George Bush Sr. and Dung had a lot of talks, and they uh, both had a very good uh, relationship. Uh, Jim Lilly, who later became ambassador under uh, Bush, uh, said that they both seemed to recognize they were going to play even more important roles in their respective governments, and they sort of took a measure of each other and got to know each other. So that later times, when they had difficulties, the two of them could uh, work in resolving them. When President Reagan was running for his presidency, uh, in the campaign he began to talk about the importance of Taiwan and recognizing uh, that maybe the United States could have formal recognition of Taiwan that was so important. Dung was not very happy to hear that, and for a couple of years he ranted and raved about how horrible that was. But by about 1982, Bush Sr. was able to get uh, Reagan to uh, change his policy, and he stopped talking about normalization of Taiwan, and that made it possible for Reagan uh, to visit uh, China. And here he is, and you see the comment that Reagan made after the visit. Uh, he didn't seem like a communist. Uh, he seemed like a guy you could work with. I think it's quite remarkable. You can see the variety of Americans that he met. And he got along with Carter and Reagan and uh, Bush Sr. Uh, a variety of different people. He really had an ability uh, to relate to people of very different uh, persuasion and personality. In 1982, uh, Maggie Thatcher, uh, the Iron Lady, uh, went to Beijing. Since it was just after the Cultural Revolution, there were a lot of people who doubted whether the Chinese leadership had the capacity to provide constructive leadership for a modern, capitalist, global city like Hong Kong. Uh, and Maggie Thatcher uh, thought that uh, it might be a good idea to have sovereignty go back to China as we expect in 97. But perhaps they should allow British to continue to administer Hong Kong. Uh, her advisors had tried to make it clear that that was not possible. China wouldn't accept it. Uh, but uh, her advisors were very strong. Uh, her advisors uh, were not very strong compared to Thatcher. And she had just won the battles uh, with Argentina over the Falklands. And she was in no position to give it easily. Uh, so when she had the meeting, she presented to Deng. Deng made very clear that would not go. He wanted the Chinese to take over afterwards. And what he had in mind really was that they would begin training people who would be prepared 15 years later to take over the responsible positions of leadership. At the time, they didn't have them. So he sent down one of his most progressive, able, provincial first party secretary, Xi Jiapun, uh, from Jiangsu and sent him down uh, to uh, be uh, the head of the Hong Kong office. 
and to provide the contacts with higher level Chinese businessmen and British leaders that could make it possible for China to train people who would take high positions after 1997. <clears throat> At the end of this visit in 1982, uh, Thatcher uh, walked out of the building uh, and she tripped. Now, uh, the act uh, Dung has sometimes been called the steel factory. So the Hong Kong papers that got pictures of this, uh, when Thatcher tripped, it was as if the steel factory had delivered a stronger message and the Iron Lady uh, was uh, yielding to this uh, steel factory. Uh, and for about two years they carried on uh, negotiations. But two years later, after those negotiations, it was worked out that after all, China would resume sovereignty, that the administration of Hong Kong would be done by China. Uh, and uh, however, there would be two systems, completely different systems, and Hong Kong would be allowed to preserve its system. So at the end of those two years, after they worked out those agreements, they were able to make a joint declaration on Hong Kong, and there Thatcher is happily uh, greeting uh, Dung uh, in a very good uh, mood, and they both uh, seem to be celebrating their success. Dung wanted to join all kinds of international organizations. He believed that not only did China need to join those, but by uh, abiding by the rules of those international organizations, that would push reform within China. And particularly Zhu Hongji, uh, who later came a little later, uh, <coughs> believed in that. Uh, here Deng is uh, talking with the President of the World Bank, uh, Robert McNamara. Here he is talking uh, with the head of the International Monetary Fund. Those of you who are old enough remember that long before Wikipedia, we used to have things called encyclopedias. <laughs> and uh, at the time, here is uh, Frank Gibney representing the encyclopedia discussing with Dung how that could be translated into Chinese as a quick way to bring knowledge of the outside world uh, to the Chinese people. <clears throat> uh, here he, he has, I've gone through the Deng Xiaoping Yin Pu, which is a five volume series of chronology of Deng's meetings with all kinds of people. I don't recall that Deng had any meeting uh, with an economist. Now, economists could have been part of the delegation, but he did not meet economists. He loved meeting business people, uh, he loved meeting scientists and people of government responsibility. He liked to meet people who had run things. So here he, he met a lot of foreign business people. Uh, here he is with President Bank of America, uh, President of Time Magazine, entrepreneurial delegation. Uh, here he is with some uh, uh, Macau uh, and Guangzhou uh, business people. Uh, Henry Clark, who built the White Swan Hotel in Guangzhou. Uh, here he is meeting a leading Hong Kong billionaire, Li Kashi. Um, here he is with Wang An, uh, who at the time on Dung's terms of uh, meeting those three conditions. But there were so many people who were dissatisfied uh, that when Dung invited in all the reporters from the outside media to report on the meeting, 
the, uh, rep the reporters found that there was something interesting, even more interesting, happening in Beijing. Uh, Hui Bang had suddenly died, and so people took to the streets to remember him. Uh, and before long, because there were lots of complaints uh, of uh, students who felt that the political commissars around them uh, were hounding them, they didn't have freedom to choose their own jobs, uh, and uh, lived in terrible dormitory conditions, uh, and there was a lot of corruption in the government, uh, they felt that they, they wanted to demonstrate and a lot of people in Beijing who were uh, overwhelmed by the inflation started in 1988, uh, were also supporting uh, the student demonstrators. So we had these huge student demonstrations. Uh, here's the goddess of democracy brought into Tiananmen. You can see the size of several hundred thousand people in the square uh, demonstrating against the government. On May 20th, 1989, Dunn sent in the troops unarmed to try to establish order. They were not only stopped by the students, they were stopped by people in Beijing who were upset about the inflation, uh, and so they could not move in to establish order. After that, Dunn, like many other top leaders, felt they only had one choice, and that was send in the troops, tell them to do whatever is necessary uh, to reestablish order, and so they sent in the tanks, uh, and they sent in the troops, and several hundred people were killed in the process before uh, the uh, soldiers were able to establish order in Tiananmen Square. After, immediately after that, the United States and other countries issued sanctions against China for their crackdown. Uh, Bush Sr., who had known Dung so well in 1975, immediately wrote a personal private letter and said that uh, we realize uh, that uh, you will be upset with our sanctions, but you should know that the reason we're doing that is not because we're trying to weaken China. It's because we Americans have found that respect for democracy and human rights is so important to the way we do things that we need to have a policy that will implement our respect for those things. However, I know that it's so hard to establish relations when it, between our countries. In the 1960s, we could not do it. It took a lot of work to reestablish those relations. I want to keep open, even despite our sanctions, relations with two countries. I would like to send a representative of mine to Beijing uh, to continue those discussions. Then immediately said yes, and Brent Skokrov from the White House went to Beijing to keep open the thread of relationships even though the sanctions were being imposed. Uh, uh, Bush Sr. said that he, was, he did this partly because he had his personal relationship with Deng Xiaoping, and he felt that that was possible uh, because of their special relationship. <clears throat> At the time, uh, this picture of Deng in the water was circulating. The message is, stay calm, stay calm, uh, don't get excited. Uh, within several years, these foreigners who have a lot of sanctions, will realize that the China market's a big market, and the businessmen will be going to their government, and they will be telling their government, uh, we should begin to we, uh, get over the sanctions and resume good relations. And before long, uh, we will, uh, because foreigners have short memories, uh, things will be over. In the meantime, just stay calm. Uh, by the end of 1992, Deng was satisfied that China's men was pursuing a policy that he wanted. Deng by this time was 88 years old, so it's encouragement to all people at that age, and uh, if I remember correctly, uh, your MM and uh, your uh, former uh, president, Nathan, were about that same age uh, at the present time. But here is Deng uh, waving goodbye to the political stage, finally, at age 88. Uh, here he is up close, uh, waving goodbye. Over the next seven years, uh, Dung pretty much cultivated his, his garden, walked around the garden after 1992. Uh, he passed away in 1997. Uh, here's the memorial service for Dung and, and the Great Hall of the Peoples. Uh, here is Jones and Men delivering the memorial. And because Dung had been in the United Nations in 1974 and delivered the maiden speech, uh, so here he is getting global recognition 
uh, for his service to the country and the links with the international community, uh, and they observed a moment of silence on Dunn's death. Thank you very much.